You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Life is not easy. Life isn't fair. It never was, and it never will be. A good life takes grit, because the best things in life come from hard work, sacrifice, resolve, determination, and perseverance. Because grit means never quitting. It means coming back time and time again until you succeed. So on this show, we talk hunting, we talk outdoors, we talk conservation, we talk family, and life. We talk fitness, and we talk strength, strength of body, strength of mind, and strength of character. Prioritize who you are and who you want to be. Get gritty, because life isn't fair, and a little grit can make all the difference. All right, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. Uh, We're in the Gritty Studio here at Mountain Ops HQ. What do you call it, Casey? I like HQ. It command sounds, base. Uh, I've tried command center. That's too too long. <laughs> I've tried barracks. That doesn't quite <laughs> fit what's going on here. So HQ usually sets the precedence well. Yeah. Move the microphone a little closer so I can hear the soft, rich tones of your masculine voice. Is that better, baby? <laughs> it's getting better. How about now? <laughs> <laughs> It'll work. It'll work. So I'm here with Casey Harbertson. And um, today we are going to talk about uh, our trip to New Zealand, and and what an what an incredible experience that was. So we're just going to jump right into it. And we've done a podcast uh, while we were on the mountain with uh, with our friends and guides, uh, Sam Manson and Sean the Sheep, Sean the Sheep, Sean which Roach. is uh, Sean Roach, and we um, we had a blast. Yes. So. We just wanted to do another podcast on the subject because, uh, and kind of walk through the hunt and, and describe how it went down. And, and, uh, the other podcast we did was pretty, uh, scattershot. We just kind of sat down and, and hung out. And, and this one, um, we're going to walk through the, the hunt and hopefully people will have a good time just kind of following along. Yeah. The other one's a good conversation. This one hopefully will be good as well. But, uh, we didn't really get to get into a lot of the nitty gritty details of what happened over there or what the experience was like. Yeah. So, uh, this is, that was my first time to New Zealand. I've never been there before. I didn't know what to expect. For some reason I pictured, I pictured it looking a little more like Hawaii and (laughs) palm trees everywhere. Yeah. For some reason, (laughs) like at least along the coast. And then, then I thought it'd be more, more, more Lord of the Rings when you got up in the mountains, you know? Like uh, Middle Earth, because just because I've watched Lord of the Rings, you know, there may be some truth to that. Uh, I've only been, so I've been in New Zealand twice. You land in Auckland, which is in the North Island. There's two islands, North mm-hmm. Island, South Island. And we hunted on the South Island out of Queenstown, which is like probably a two hour flight from Antarctica, if you look at it on, yeah, on, on a map. map. Um, but I think on the North Island, it is. More tropical. Yeah. Because you're kind of getting up there towards the Polynesian Islands. But I could be wrong. But a a lot of people that I've talked to are like, did you go to the resorts there? And I'm like, no. No. No, we were in the mountains. (laughs) Yeah. So different. Um, If you had one word to describe New Zealand, Casey, what what would it be? Um, Majestic. Like, Mm. I I can't remember which word I used in the other podcast. But after thinking about it now, majestic is the word. And I don't even know the definition of majestic. <laughs> we should probably plug it in. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely majestic. Let's look it up right now. We got the Googleizer. I'm curious myself. Because to, to it define the feeling of majestic that you have when you're there, you have these tall, incredibly steep, rugged mountains. You have stag running through the fog. You have tar um, piling through the fog all over the hillsides. You have Shammy living in the most incredibly interesting terrain. And so the word majestic just comes to mind because it's like no other place I've ever been. Right. Yeah. 
dictionary says having or showing impressive beauty or dignity. Oh, it's definitely majestic then. Yeah. 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 Uh, and we were there in their winter. So everything's dead. I mean, typically it's green, rolly hills and, and beautiful lush green mountains, but you know, it was, it was the heart of their winter over there, even though it was the, the middle of our summer here, or I guess beginning of our summer here. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. It's hard for me. Like when I think of New Zealand, um, I can't help. I mean, the word epic comes to mind and that word is like really overused. Yeah. That's why I tried to steer clear of that one, <laughs> but it's still, that's what comes to mind, man. Uh, yeah. The dictionary says, uh, basically, um, a long film book or other work portraying heroic deeds and adventures or covering an extended period of time. Uh, but then the adjective is relating to or characteristic of an epic series or an epic heroic or grand in scale or character. Uh, particularly impressive or remarkable. Yeah. I mean, it just, it does have that otherworldly feel. It does. I mean, a lot of people, another overly used word is awesome. And I think the definition is, definition is to leave one in a state of awe. Yeah. And I'll tell you, New Zealand literally leaves you from the moment you land in Queenstown, you're in awe. Yeah. I think the mountains are, cause I've been in the mountains of, you know, up in Colorado, up high. Uh, 12,000 feet. And again, there's cliffs and rugged hills and there's deer and elk and bear, cougar and, and so on. I've seen, uh, bighorn sheep, goats, like all this stuff is, is out there as well. And it's, it's got that incredible storybook feel. But New Zealand, um, it's, it's like you see some mountains in Colorado and then, then you see some flat areas in the mountains. But New Zealand, it's like Alps. Like they're straight up. They call it the Southern Alps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and they're just so steep and they just go up and up and up. And they're where we were at, at least, it wasn't like we were just driving to a single mountain or a little range. It was like the mountains were everywhere, everywhere you look yeah. left, right, front, mm -hmm. center. It's just, they're there. Yeah. Like when you're here in Utah, you can drive up I-15 and you always have the mountains on your right hand side and they call that the Wasatch Front. Mm -hmm. Uh there's mountains on the left-hand side if you're driving north occasionally, but literally you're driving through mountains left and right everywhere. You're never not driving in mountains yeah. where we were on the South Island. The other thing that makes it feel otherworldly is the water. Yeah. Because you have to, I mean, every, it seems like when you get off the beaten path you, to go anywhere, there, you're you're going to need to cross freshwater streams that just blow your mind. Big, big runoffs everywhere. Well, when you think of those giant lakes, like even you get into Queenstown, that lake is huge. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the lake we were hunting around, that lake was huge. And we drove past other huge lakes. There's water everywhere in New Zealand. right? And what were they saying? Something about it having the most freshwater than any country in the, yes. in the world. Yeah. 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 More New Zealand produces more fresh water than any country in the world. I think was the, the quote. Um, you think about that. I mean, the That's, snow on top of those mountains, it's all melting and coming off. And it's just, they said that you can drive out to the Alps where we were at and they were watching each morning to figure out, cause it's, they were watching each morning to figure out whether or not we should drive across or not with one of the vehicles. Cause one of the vehicles didn't have a snorkel. Yeah. And it's like every vehicle seems to have a snorkel <laughs> Well, that for was, this reason. And that's, what's funny is, you know, you see guys driving around in the States with snorkels and it's like, do you even use your snorkel? Bro? Yeah. For real. Have you ever put that to use? <laughs> they legitimately have to, oh, to just to get to their house. Yeah. Oh, some, yeah. some folks, um, and so in, yeah, in New Zealand, it's, it's almost like, it seems as though you, you, every vehicle needs a snorkel. And then when you hit the water, you know, and you come across, you, you get in pretty deep, but their concern was all it has to do is get super hot that day, melt a ton of snow or have a storm come in and the rain come down. And that river will be too deep for a vehicle without a snorkel to, to get across mm -hmm. within a few hours. And, and that's, it'll be deep for multiple days. Yeah. So even though we had a certain set of days set out that we were going to be able to hunt in this area, we literally could have been stuck or had to call in a helicopter or something like that mm -hmm. to get us out because 
if that river would have gotten rose by however many feet, it may have been days that we were stuck there and missed our flights back. Right. So that's, and it's kind of like that all over the place, you know? Yeah. Just whenever um, you go, you're crossing some kind of river. It seems like. Yeah. And, uh, we were driving out one night and, uh, Sam's driving the vehicle with the snorkel. We had to abandon the other truck a couple of times yeah. on the other side of the river. Cause we weren't sure what the weather was going to bring that day. And we didn't want to bring the truck without the snorkel snorkel across. So we just, we all carpooled in, in one snorkel equipped vehicle. As we're coming back though, the sun's going down. It's dark, actually pitch dark. We're driving along. The headlights are shining in the, in this big river we're crossing. You're probably about three feet deep. Yeah. And, and giant, trout <laughs> is just like swimming in front of the headlights in in this in this river and uh yeah it's 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 incredible yeah new zealand's known for its hunting uh but they're probably more well known for their fishing the brown trout that are over there yeah and that's one of the things i've been over there twice now and and haven't even thro- dropped a line i know it's and it's wrong i know it is but when we saw that fish it was it was like the width of the truck we were in. Yeah. It was a big fish. Big old, big old trout. And those trout are not native. And yet it has some of the best trout fishing in the world. So that just gives yeah. people a picture of what what the place is like. I mean, between the water and the mountains and the, the snow-capped Alps, um, it's just incredible country. And then to me, what gives it that real epic and otherworldly feel is the fog. Mm-hmm. The fog is... You know, it's just so ethereal and it feels so like Lord of the Rings. It it does. It's like you're sitting in a uh the scene of a movie, you know, actually there playing playing the part like you, you always say Lord of the Rings, but you think of all these these movies, whether it be Vikings on the History Channel or or Lord of the Rings or whatever else, where a lot of it was filmed in fog. And I don't know if they just have fog all year round or if it's just in the winter, but we experienced the same thing the first time I was over there two years before. Like it's there, there's always fog. And eventually in the, in the afternoon, it can burn off if the sun rises. Mm-hmm. But what we experienced is there was a couple of days there where we were just in fog all day long. And, uh, it's definitely majestic and mesmerizing, but it can become kind of claustrophobic after a little while. Yeah. And you feel wet. Yeah. Like, wet the whole time it's just sort of in the air i i hunted uh in in on prince of wales island it's one of the only places i've come across fog that's similar where i couldn't see eight feet in front of me you know it's just you're blind absolutely blind it's like you're inside the clouds up there so um we we had trouble hunting the first couple of days because of mm-hmm. the fog yeah, I mean, we we the first day we had to bag all together uh, driving out to where we we're going to hunt tar because they looked at the weather and said, we literally will be in the fog all day. Instead, let's head out the next day and you guys can go mess around, try and chase some fallow and chase some stags and, and see what you can get done with a bow. But as far as the tar country, which is a lot higher elevation, there's not even really a point. So you're so, literally hiking into the clouds, it feels like. Yeah, you. I mean, so we're starting around roughly less than a thousand feet elevation, mm-hmm. and you can see that at about two thousand feet of elevation, clouds start, and then you don't see the tops of the mountains, and the mountains are about four plus thousand. Yeah, and so the tar, where we were seeing the tar, was kind of at like that fifteen thousand to yeah twenty five. Or 1,500 to 2,500 feet elevation. Although I did see some. We saw, we glassed, Sam and I glassed some up in the snow. Oh, you guys did see some up even higher? Oh, nice. Yeah, we we didn't, uh, Sean and I didn't spend as much time because we were further down uh, the the drainage than you guys. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you're kind of like, all right, so we're going into the fog. Like, how effective is this going to be? Right. Well, in uh, the country, like, um, like it's different. Uh, it's so steep and so is like places in Colorado, but a lot of times you have really thick, thick, um, bush you got to get through and then it breaks out and then there's no brush to the peak where above timberline where it's all just snow each year, most of the year. And there's not much brush. 
Um, where we were at, it seemed like it was fairly clear all the way up the mountains. You got grass and stuff, but in the cuts, you'd have matagari, which is that spiky, hellish plant, you Crazy know, that's uh, yeah. got one inch spines on it, and it's worse than like a blackberry bush, you know, it's 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 dense. Well, it's Woody. brutal, yeah. I mean, it's uh, I honestly think Satan created it. <laughs> I mean, it, absolutely, it's that it's that hellacious. It, it, it is not fun. I, I, you know, walking around hunting in it, and the tar love it. Yeah, I mean, they were they hide in that. They hide in that, and like, it's it's not hard for them to no, disappear in it. It's no. that thick. Um, so I mean, I was surprised by that, but I was also surprised the sheer number of tar mm-hmm. uh, where they lived. I when I did a little research when I got home about tar, one of the things that they attribute to the tar's success as an invasive species. And, and as a species in general, is that um, in comparison to like a mountain goat, they will travel long, uh, quite a distance down to areas where the grass and the feed is super lush, feed and then go back up in the evenings. And they're very, they're, they're daily, they have a daily migratory process that they follow where, you know, elk do that too. Mm-hmm. I've seen them up there at high elevation hunts. They come down feed in the big open meadows, you know, all in for elk. It's throughout the evening generally, but, and then they'll, in the morning, they'll climb to the top, you know, and get to what they feel is safety. Well, those tar, they would, they would be down low in the mornings when we arrived in the call. And as soon as the, the fog would burn off, you could just see tar all over in the lowlands. Mm -hmm. And when I say lowlands, it's just sort of like rolling grassy hills that get pretty steep and then you hit like the real rugged stuff above that. It's all rocky and cliffed out. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is like the rolly, um, the rolly Hills. I mean, it's, it's got some, some, I mean, it's steep. Mm -hmm. It's a lot steeper than it looks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that, which is both good and bad. Mm -hmm. Um, it's almost like it has benches. Well, as you say, you've got your benches. It rolls very, very subtly with how steep it is, but it it makes for a hard ambush. Yeah, because the the uh, the tussocks grass mm-hmm. is what it's called. It's not super tall. No, and so if you can't hit a bench and the tar aren't in the right spot, you're a sitting duck. Yeah. Well, I noticed uh, when I helped mule deer in Alberta. It's rolling hills like that, and it can get kind of steep here. And it's mostly flat because it's the badlands, you know. But it's got deep cuts where it gets real steep, like almost like coolies that are just cut, notched into the the earth, you know. And those deer will be down in those coolies. But still, when you sneak up on them, it's it's like it'd be like having all the deer bedded up top in the grass, like a hundred of them, and now you're trying to sneak up on one, one, yep. and that made it really tough. And we only had three days to hunt. Yeah, we so we lost the, the first day due to the fog. Basically lost the second day due, due to the fog. And then had kind of two days. Of intense tar. Get it done. Yeah. You got two days, yep. And those two days, we did get a break in the, in the, in the fog. And we had our first sunny day. And you could just see. And it was legit. Um but prior to that, we did get on a tar on that first day um, that we glassed down in a canyon. Mm-hmm. And, and and what we did is, is, is the fog was sort of lifting. We, we moved up as the fog lifted, and we were kind of just letting the land reveal itself. And then we'd come on a group of tar, see if there was a bull in the group, no bull, kind of just keep easing up this this mountain, looking down into the deep cut. There's a river, a little you know, stream flowing in the bottom. And as we're moving up, we just didn't see a bull, didn't see a bull. And then when we started to see a bull, they were just younger bulls. And to me, Casey, they were all awesome. And Uh, I always shoot them with my bow. I know that was the hard thing (laughs) is it was like, you, you finally decided, Oh, that one's a bull. Let's go kill it. And they're like, no, that's not what we're looking for. for. I'm like, I'm looking for anything with this. Do you see the stick and string? Yeah, exactly. What are we looking for? <laughs> They've never hunted with archery or they haven't hunted enough with archery guys. And they're like, we'll take what we can get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we go up that Canyon and, um, and then, for, and I, I kept going. So when I first got there, I'd, I'd never hunted tar before. And so I would see tar it took me a while to start to get an eye 
mm-hmm. a game eye for, for what tar looked like on the landscape. But after a f- couple of few hours, I was like, okay, now, now I see tar. It took me like another day to figure out when I was looking at a bull or not okay. a bull. It took me at least another day before I could figure out whether that bull was mature or not mature. Mm-hmm. And, um, but on that first day, they spotted a tar down on the river bottom. And that was the first time I saw Sam and Sean actually get excited. Like, oh my gosh, we have a stud bull. That's what we're looking for. That's what we've been looking for all day. And I'm like, yes, finally, yeah. I have permission. Like I, <laughs> like, I can go and pursue something. I think one of the reasons they were doing that too is like, there's so many tar you could literally, and we did it. You, you could literally just chase tar all over the mountain and blow tar all over the place. Yeah. Um, the cool thing about when we saw the tar you're referring to the bull, I mean, not only was, could you tell he was a magnificent tar based on his body language and his size and everything else, but it was, he was actually kind of positioning himself into a more killable spot. He was totally stockable Yeah, because you know, couple of things. If I had my druthers, when I'm on a stock, these are some things I would like to have. Okay. I would like to be able to come from above. Mm -hmm. I would like it to be very steep, at least steep enough that, you know, they're, they don't, they are not looking up or they don't, they don't see me coming so I can get very close. I would like the wind to be solid blowing down Canyon or up Canyon, whatever it is, but to be consistent. And when you get that close to like a river bottom in general, it sucks the wind in one direction. So you figure out which way that's going and and you make your approach. So I want the wind good. I want it to be steep and and cliffy and I want a loud river (laughs) covering the sound of me kicking rocks off hills and everything as I get close. All those pieces were all together in that magic moment. It was like, okay, this tar will die. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a, so, such a killable, um, position for it to be in. So Sam and I got on it fast, started cruising down that hill, uh, got in position, came down right where the tar were. It was a great stock. Everything was going according to plan. Um, I was, um, one thing I will say, like when it comes to bow hunting with a bow and getting into bow range, I'm, when it comes down to that moment toward the end, there's like this balance between moving quickly and then moving slowly. And, and, uh, so on each of these stocks, I didn't get to, to like lead those, right. Cause Sam's kind of the guide and kind of walking you through it and stuff and such. So, you know, whenever that happens, you're, you do things that, that you wouldn't do if you were on your own. And I would approach from this way or that way. And it's not like one is better than the other. Aaron and I would run into the same thing. Ben and Anthony and I would run into the same thing. There's so many different ways to skin a cat, so many different ways to approach a situation. Um, and it's, it's different for everyone, but you have your own set of strengths and weaknesses. I mean, mine is really, it's a double edged sword, but being sneaky, patient and taking a very painstaking time to get there and in position when I'm closing that last distance, you know, Sam is a lot more, um, guns ablaze and charging (laughs) in kind of guy. So, uh, anyway, we, we, we get down and we're at this spot where there's some cliffs. If you fall, you'll, you're dead. Yeah. And, um, Keith was running the camera and more than a couple of times, he didn't have the best boots. He wasn't as prepared. He hasn't been in this kind of country as much as Sam and I, and, there's a few times where, uh, it, it was, um, Keith could have died, you know, it was that sketchy, you know? And so, um, but we get real close Casey and tars coming up and the river and I can see, I can see where we can't find the bull, but there are, there are nannies, like three or four nannies around us that we can see. And they're only 30 or 40 yards away. 70 yards at some and and they're just kind of looking up and they saw movement and i was surprised how keen they were and how long they locked on for but eventually um they kind of fed down right by the river and i'm like okay great now now we can move in and we we were moving in moving in well um sam was paying close attention to the wind which was perfect because you you know if you get smell if you get winded it's over yep so that was perfect but as, as Sam was peeking over a ridge to see what, you know, if they're there and we're right on top of them, 
it was like, okay, you know, that's where the moment of truth is. And the idea is you peek over a ridge and you see an animal before it sees you. But every time you peek your head over, you're at risk of getting seen. And for some reason, I was thinking this was going to be rather easy. This is day one. Here we are, first stock, and and here we are about to kill a monster bull. I'm like, this is great. Um, <laughs> this not very is hard. <laughs> um, this tar hunting is for, for uh, it's simple stuff. Yeah. And then, um, well, Sam peeks over, and I think like 15 tar scatter just everywhere. Well, when Tam, they're so switched on. That it's, I found they're like, a lot like mule deer in Alberta where you, you get skylined in two seconds. You know, if your head isn't at the level of the dirt through grass, you know, six inches high as you're peeking over a, a slope and you come over more in a vertical stance, dude, they pick you off over. in a second. doesn't matter if you have a background behind you. It, it helps a little bit, but they, they are keen eyed. They, they, they were like jerk their heads up. They saw a little stuff out of the corner of their eye. And when they saw that, they didn't wait around, stall, look at you like maybe a mule deer in Colorado. Like, what is that? They bolt out of there. So, um, this bull bolts that all the, all the, all the, um, nannies bolt and I get the full draw and the bull stops and gives me one second to, to pull a 50 yard shot off. And, and it just wasn't enough time. It was only his butt that he really gave me. And then he went over the hill and, uh, what was awesome though is as they spilled over the hill and they crossed the river at the bottom and on the opposite side was a, just a sheer cliff wall. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, we got to watch the whole group just climb a cliff. Yeah. It was probably a couple hundred feet. Yeah. And Sean and I are watching from a few hundred yards away. Um, this, all of this go down. We, we can't see you, but we see the tar blow out of the bottom. And they start running up this sheer cliff and my mind just blown. Yeah. How can something that large run up something that flat? Yeah. And I've seen it with mountain goat, you know, but now I get to watch tar and they just went up it like it was nothing. Just running. Just running straight up. Straight up. Yeah. Up a cliff. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And I was like. That was awesome. I was like. Sam, can we get a shot? You know, can we get, and I'm ranging and I'm ranging. And unfortunately it was like a hundred and something yards. Like, and they didn't gr- create any greater distance yeah, no. because they were going vertical. So it was like the distance stayed the same for like five minutes where I could have taken like a hundred and 110 yard shot on a tar on a cliff. But then you deal with it falling off a cliff and yeah. other things too. But that's just a little too far for me. And, and, uh, I'm not that kind of archer. My guess is you would have scared him in the fall would have killed him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I, I don't know. They're pretty, pretty raw. They're pretty gnarly critters. So that was amazing. I mean, the country, it was my first taste of what that country looks like. First taste of uh, a tar close up and, and a first taste of how switched on they are. Yeah. I think if you would have come over that hillside and that tar would have been grazing perfectly broadside at 30 yards, and you pulled back and let that arrow buck, drilled him right through the heart, you wouldn't have appreciated that animal, that experience, that country, the way that you appreciate it now, because that would have just been like, oh, okay, stock one, let's do this. Yeah, I totally agree. If I hadn't, um, you know, if I had just come over and shot it, uh, I wouldn't have realized that that was just beginner's luck, mm-hmm. you know? That that there that there's a big challenge in trying to kill a tar. Yeah, you know, m- much more challenge than I initially thought. Sam and and Sean were our were our guides on this trip, and tell me, you know, your impressions of the two of them. You've hunted a little bit with with uh, Sam before. Was it both of us the first time to meet Sean? Yeah, I killed my first tar with Sam two years ago, and my favorite thing that sam does is uh he likes to check the wind (laughs) Uh, a new zealand wind checker is a cigarette that's right and uh i'm pretty sure sam can hang with just about anyone honestly Mm -hmm. uh loaded pack no pack it it depends um or it, it really doesn't matter 
But man, those guys can check the wind. They uh, <laughs> they they smoke a lot, and we were making fun of them because their cigarette packs the the warnings that they put yeah. on, and and they they've got some pretty funny. Yeah, stuff Yeah, in on New there. Zealand, they they're required by law, I guess, mm-hmm. to put a horrific picture of what smoking can do to you on the pack on yeah. each cigarette package. It could be like the fact that your foot's gonna fall off, or the fetus is gonna die inside of you, or you're gonna become impotent. They're like, not messing around with those pictures on those uh, cigarette packages. No, they're pretty graphic. <laughs> like, like every time you smoke, when you know what you're getting into, <laughs> there's no like pussyfooting around the but issue. They don't care, you no. know? And, and so when I was with, but the crazy thing is that being said, uh, Sam could smoke a pack and go out hike either one. Of oh us. yeah. As, as we're climbing these Hills and I'm breathing pretty heavy, he's smoking and climbing at the same time doing just fine. Yeah. So, uh, but I've always believed like when it comes to things like that, for example, um, it's all about stacking up a, a number of vices to health isn't like black or white you smoke. So now you're falling apart. No, absolutely not. No. I mean, if you're exercising and you're fit and you drink a lot of water and and you eat well and all that, and then your vice is smoking certainly isn't good for you, but it's just one, one vice that's negative and and bad for you. But it's, and, and certainly, you know, something you should probably steer away from, but at the same time, it's cumulative And all those other things are working in your benefit and you can see people who have, you know, maybe they drink quite a bit or maybe it's, they smoke or, or something like that. Or drink a 20 pack of diet soda two times a day, like whatever it is. Yeah. But everything else is super dialed. You'll see that with guys that drink a lot of energy drinks, you know, but everything is dialed everywhere else. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me. Like I see Aaron do a couple cans of Copenhagen a day on, on these backcountry hunts. I'm sure that's not good for you, but Aaron seems to be hyper fit at the same it, time. It's like it doesn't even affect him. You yeah. Know? And, but when I was with Sam the first time, he was just an animal. And what's fun for those guys is the clients that they typically get, uh, they don't get to go do the types of hunting that we did. Right. They don't get to go and hike in. They don't really get multiple stock opportunities. You know, they'll just get close enough as they can with a gun and tell the guy, all right, rip it off. Like, let's kill this one. Right. So what's fun for them. And one of the reasons why they didn't want us to shoot, I would say, a, a, a non-mature bull was this is an opportunity for them to be able to take somebody to kill a really cool tar. Cause they don't get that opportunity yeah. often unless they're hunting with themselves. Yeah. And you know, the fun thing about Sean was Sean wasn't, I don't think Sean even smoked one cigarette. He doesn't even smoke, but he, he was just an animal, man. He, he, we were hiking all over the place. Um, he, I, so <laughs> I left my pack at the lodge. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So Sean had to carry all How my convenient stuff. convenient for Casey. I know. I left it, right? But I literally brought a pack all the way to New Zealand only to leave it in the lodge. Yeah. And like an hour into our drive, I was like, I think I left my pack. We checked the back of the truck. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> so I just carried my bow the entire time. So Sean had to carry all my crap too. So Sean was a stud because he was either carrying spotting scopes, food, water, uh, clothing, whatever it is that I couldn't, cause I didn't have anywhere to put it. He yeah. was carrying it. Right. And then he was carrying a gun on top of that for the first couple of days. Cause he really just wanted me to kill one with a gun. Like both him and Sam were like, just do it with a gun. Just do it with right, a gun. Right. But you and I were like, no, we're doing this with a bow. So finally, you know, Sean, I was like, Sean, I, I think we need to have a, a talk about our relationship here. Like, <laughs> just so you know, that gun's not coming out. I don't care how big that tar is. Like, yeah. It's, I've already killed one. Yep. It's happening with a bow. Or not at all. Or not at all. Yeah. And I was fine with that. And that's what was cool with Sean. And Sean was like, dude, it's your hunt. Like, Then I'm going to leave the rifle out at the truck. And, <laughs> and at the same time, thanks for not making me carry this around. You know? <laughs> right. But both of them were absolute animals, and they both just loved to get after it. Yeah. And they were so much fun to hunt with. Well, um, that first day, the first day I got to actually let an arrow fly, um, that it was still foggy that day. And we, we kept fumbling around and kind of stumbling around for, for, uh, some shots. And sure enough, um, we finally through the fog, uh, I was with Sam and Keith, I think you and Sean were 
We had stayed lower. You guys went higher Mm because we saw a ton of tar down on that lower finger. And you guys kind of went after the tar on the upper part of that finger. And as we got higher, it got dense. Mm -hmm. The fog got dense. And so we're walking along, walking along on a a slope, on on a side hill. And, man, we we just came on a group of tar. A nice bull, really nice bull, a good bull. And uh, Sam is in front of me. And there's a ridge and hills and brushes and stuff in my way. Sam too. And, uh, and Sam's like, can you make that shot? Can you make that shot? And I'm like looking and trying to see where this tar is. Cause it's pretty dense fog. And then, uh, and then I'm, I'm like, he has a, a Swarrow range finding bino. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's, he's like ping and ping and ping and trying to find, trying to get the range. And, uh, so I can shoot, come to full draw and shoot. And he's like, and uh, he keeps getting a yardage of like 20 yards, but it's obvious this, this tar is, you know, much further away than that. And so I pull out my range finder. It's the Leupold little mon- monocular. And I had already, I was using the Garmin zero as well. And I'd already tested it in the fog and it did the same thing. The Swaro did, um, you know, by design, it doesn't have a real powerful, it doesn't use a lot of power for the batteries and so forth. So it just lasts a long time. And, um, but so it doesn't punch through the fog either. And uh, there's very few that do. I think you're, you had a SIG. Yeah, the SIG. So the SIG was getting reads through the fog, mm-hmm. but it was getting so cold that it wasn't reading. That was the problem mm-hmm. I was having with the SIG. So I actually ended up switching over to my Leupold 1200 BTX or whatever. TBR. Or TBR. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, because... I I found for me once the fog was gone and yeah. we were dealing with that, I, that it was so cold I couldn't get a range with that sig. Mm. Yeah, I was I had the I think I have the sixteen hundred the Leupold sixteen hundred, mm-hmm. and um, it worked like a charm, you know. So I'm ranging and it said I think fifty six or sixty yards, can't remember now. And so um, I was like, well, okay, I know the yardage. I I quickly uh, set, I, the Garmin when I shoot that it's just fixed pins. Mm-hmm. just tap a button on the riser and it's fixed pin set up. So put my 60 yard pin on him and I was, um, stubborn and insistent on shooting with a hinge release. <laughs> and so I, I've got, uh, John Dudley's uh, hinge release and I was coming, I came to full draw with the hinge and I was pulling through the shot and it felt good. I was like, okay, let's make a real good shot here. I was pretty relaxed at that point. Cause you know, it's like you're confident, right? Yeah. You're going down. And uh, just as I was taking the shot, just before it broke, the tar took a step, shot breaks. We couldn't tell where the arrow went. It looked like it went to the left, Sam said, behind the tar where the tar was standing. And, of course, that freaked him out. And he bounced down the hill a little bit. And I range him again. And um, at this point, I don't know if I hit him or didn't hit him. And I'm not happy with this follow-up shot, but I think maybe I hit him. Um, it's pretty foggy. And Sam Sam doesn't know the yardage again because he can't get a range. And so I range it, and it's something like 70 yards. So I come to full draw again and take my time. And, and now the tar is switched on. He's looking back through the fog as well, but I let that thing go. And as soon as the shot broke, it jumped like a couple of feet down the hill and he wasn't even standing remotely in the area of where the arrow, where he was when the arrow released. Uh, and, and they were like, we're out. That's twice, you know, we're out. So that was, that was an intense moment. Um, it was, it was frustrating though. I was really frustrated because it was just, we were bumping into them in the fog and they were already onto us and you're taking longer shots. We're struggling with getting, yardages you know i can't rely on sam to range um you know normally he could just ping it while i'm at full draw or i could use the the range finder in the garmin and just get my pin and and take my shot but it just none of that stuff it was like you were fighting against it and and then twice with the hinge you know not being able to just launch it when the pins lined up you know, and then having it bounce away, I was like, ah. and and for me, I really like a shot where the animal doesn't know I'm there yeah. and I can just slowly pull through and make that great shot, especially at longer ranges. I don't like the situation I find myself in when I got a snap shoot 
It's, it's really not a strength of mine anyway. Um, I feel rushed and I, and I don't, I don't like it. So it was, a, it was a, it was a frustrating moment and it wasn't the last. There were more to come. <laughs> um, so that was, that was, we hunted till dark. Um, and, uh, chase and tar pretty much all the rest of the evening till it got real dark. We hiked out in the dark and, and that was the end of, uh, day two. And, uh, day three was when you got a shot. Yeah, that was cool because, um, I had kind of just stayed back the entire trip. And even, even on the day when you and, uh, when you guys were up in the fog, Sean and I were down lower, um, out of the fog. And I was jealous that day. Yeah. Envious because we were getting a few texts from you guys, like, and you guys were like able to actually see things we could see, but like, honestly, what we were primarily seeing was fallow deer. Mm. And the reason why is, is, uh, we, they hadn't transitioned yet out of that Matagari. They had kind of all fed down into that Matagari. And so we're sitting up on that rolly hill out of the sun where you guys are further up the Canyon or out. Yeah. in the sun, you guys are in the fog, Yeah, but like, we can't see anything, but these fallow deer everywhere. And so it wasn't until about five o'clock mm-hmm. and it got dark. Like about at six is when yeah. we lost all light. And th- that's when they started coming and feeding back up and kind of making their ways up. So we, we kind of figured out how to hunt them yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Um, so when it came to the next day, we had this game plan. So like, let's, let's, you know, kind of hunt this face where they're down in the Matagari. We'll be on this face and then everything else that's above us, like we won't even worry about because there's so many below us. And we'll split up. We'll split up. So you guys went higher, fur- higher and further and we stayed lower. And uh, what was funny is we kind of <laughs> met in the middle going so, after. <laughs> and, 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 and so here's the thing. I still don't understand who, who really owns this error, you know. Well, let's let's leave that up to the to the to the uh, <laughs> listeners. So uh, here, let me paint a picture for you. So beautiful tar bull, beautiful tar blowing bull blowing in the wind. It's like a it's like a grizzly bear of the mountain <laughs> Make, lion combination with horns. Do you know what's weird when uh, what is that show like Wizard of Oz and they're like lions, tigers, yeah. and bears. Okay, isn't a tar a lion, a tiger, and a bear? Oh, all mixed into one. That's what I mean. They're, they're talking about with tar. horns. Yeah. It's cool. Devil horns. Yeah. Like, they are like, <laughs> they're so they are badass. badass. They are. They really yeah. are. And I, I swear when you see one, you can't help but be like a big bull. It's like, and he struts too. He has this swagger and you, well, you we, can't help but be like, oh, you get way more excited about that than a young scrap, scraggly, scrappy bull. On the day when you guys were missing, when we finally, your first day or whatever. Thanks for yeah. bringing that up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to drive missing that day. a couple more times. <laughs> That's when I actually, we had this giant, giant bull come out and I actually passed three good, like really good bulls to try and shoot this one. And he just at one, we don't know what happened. We got it all on video and we still can't figure out what happened. He just decided he wanted to leave. He grabbed his nannies and left. It's kind of like the herd bull, right? Yeah. And so, um, we had seen a bull that were like, is that him? Like he, he looks pretty nice. This is on the second day, mm-hmm. the day where we finally don't have sun. And you're below, we're up high. Yeah, he he's about 125 yards away from us with some nannies down in the, in the Matagari, and and we're just watching him, and he's and he's just kind of cruising, kind of cruising all over, and all of a sudden, boom, he shows up, and he's like 80 yards away from us, heading towards me. So I'm like, all right, Sean, like I'm gonna get down to this Mm -hmm. little patch and wait for him to cut across this opening. Yeah. So I get down into that patch. He's making his way. I range him. He's 55 yards on the other side or 65 yards on the other side of this brush, Matagari. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he drops his head down. Like he's coming and nothing. And I'm like, where is this thing? Nothing. Still Mm -hmm. nothing. I'm like, he's rolling over this hill. I'm like, all right, dude, I'm going in. Mm -hmm. I figured he probably bedded down. So I start putting the ninja sneak on, going yeah. in, you know, belly crawling, going as slow as I can. <laughs> All of a sudden, I look up, and Brian's <laughs> doing the same thing. Dude, I'm belly crawling, <laughs> and I'm, like, going through the – and I look down, and I see you guys. I'm like, 
You guys are like 80 yards from me. Yeah, but I'm that, 20 yards from the tar. The tar should have been between <laughs> us. Like, it should have been. Oh. So we're, we both, I mean, it was that big of a tar that we were both like, I mean, you guys had to come a lot further than we did to go for, for him. I think he was just 200 yards away from where oh, we were. You guys weren't as high as I thought you guys were. No, we were just, we, we had planned to go up really high, but we ended up because of the fog just stopping um, right after yeah. we got into the uh, benches. Yep. So we were just sitting there and we saw it on the slope heading up the hill and then kind of turn around and go back down a little bit and then back up again and kind of just stay on that slope. So we, we hauled butt over there to get above it. So it would walk up to us and we were just one ridge away where we saw it last and we started and the wind was good. And then I just belly crawled like a hundred yards. And as I crested the hill, that hundred yards after painstakingly like sneaking through it, I see you guys there. Yeah. And I'm like, well, but we saw the tar. As soon as we crested that ridge, we looked down. We saw the bull, but he was at the very bottom by the Medigari. And I was like, I turned to Sam. I was like, is that the same bull? And he's like, I don't know, man. He was just there three so or four funny. minutes before. Now he's at the bottom. And he wasn't spooked. He wasn't running. He no, was just walking. I, neither of us blew him out. They, that's just. The, I think that's just their characteristic. That's how they are. They they're kind of everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Like they yeah. don't, they well, don't they're, sit they're, and graze. They're rutting. Time. Yes. I guess that's true. So they've got that going on too. So they're, they're these, out there to get these some bigger bulls are all over the place. Yeah. The younger bulls. Now they'll chill with the nannies. The nannies kind of stay eat. tight, but the, but these bigger bulls, man, you're just like, oh, he was just here. Where did he yeah. go? And, he and then you look up, and he's 120 yards away yeah. from you. I think he just went up, checked around, was looking for a girl, had a girl, finished up with her and was going back down yep. somewhere else. I mean, but we watched him walk off and I'm like, ah, could be him, but it's, it just doesn't seem like, like logically that he went from here to there that quickly. And so I was like, that's a different bull, I think. Sam's like, eh, don't know. I think yeah. it's the same one. And I'm like, Sam, you shut up. I, <laughs> I did I'm, not. I did up. not come this far <laughs> for it to be that one. So I snuck in, and so he was long gone. It turns yeah, out that that both of us were kind of um, sneaking up on a ghost. Yeah, really. And so what we decided to do is there was a nice bench that we could go sit on and kind of glass, uh, kind have of have lunch. a vantage, have lunch, and have a vantage point down on this Madagari that we could see all these bulls and and nannies that are kind of feeding through, and you'd see glimpses of them and. And we're having a nice lunch, and Sam decided to uh, to kind of take a, a position about a hundred yards above us, and all of a sudden you just see Sam like like points. Yeah, we're having lunch, and we're eating some pretty yummy stuff because, dude, when they pack lunches, oh, it's it's more like a full on British picnic or something. It really is. We were eating salmon quiches, and, <laughs> yeah, and like... egg and egg and bacon quiches, <laughs> and. And then we had like the most incredible licorice and, uh, and, uh, what do they call uh, them? Bumper bars. Bumper bars. Bumper bars. It's like a granola bar that's got one million times uh, better. Oh, yeah. I, actually, calling it a granola bar is it's kind of kind like, of like an shameful. oats bar with chunks of white chocolate and raspberries. Raspberries. There was another flavor. Did you have? I that? heard there is, and some people say it's their favorite, but. Oh, I'm a raspberry guy. I want that raspberry. Yeah, the white chocolate oh, raspberry. So was, good. So we're pounding those. And, and all of a sudden we hear this, like, you yep. know, just kind of caught our attention. And so we're like, hey, if Sam's getting excited about this. Let's go. So you and I were kind of like. Well, I already got a shot who, who's going earlier, on? and I'm like, your turn. Yeah. So I grabbed my stuff, uh, which consisted of just my bow since I forgot my backpack. And, uh, I started, Keith. I, I could see, well, and Keith, we got grabbed Keith and, and I could, I could see the tar coming up and the tar was like jet black. Yeah. And, uh, and so he was two ridges over about 150 yards away. And so what I decided to do was angle so that we would kind of come to the same point. Yep. And intercept uh, him, intercept him. Exactly. So we're starting to make our way. Keith's behind me. We get to the point where. I, I really don't have much more cover and I watched him kind of bleed off the backside of the ridge he was on. So I just started sprinting to try and cut some distance. Cause I knew he was going to come back over just the way that the land was laying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to cut it and, uh, gain quite a bit of distance. But the disadvantage of that was I got my heart rate up quite a bit. Yeah. And so he came up 
And meantime, while you're doing that, I'm above you. And I didn't even realize you were above me. I, I was like, okay, if he gets, if, if you don't intercept him in time and he gets past you, I've gone way above you so yeah. I could like intercept him, even you higher. know, even higher. Hindsight's twenty twenty. If I would have known you were there because he was, he was gaining he's ground. Coming, he's probably going to come to 40 or 50 yards on me. Yeah. I was going to say you would have had a much better shot than I did. And so I didn't see you until after I had shot. And I'm like, crap. Yeah. Why didn't I look to my left? But I, you know, I was just locked on. Yeah. But so we, so he comes, stands up on this perch broadside. Actually, no, kind of quartering too. And it's kind of now or never because you're probably not going to catch up to him. Oh, there's no way. They're way too fast. Like, I don't care how good of shape you are. I, they... They run straight up and, sheer Yeah, cliffs. and unless he stops for some bizarre reason, yeah, you're not going to... He just keep... cruises. Mm-hmm. So he kind of... He stopped. It was that moment of truth. So I ranged him, dialed, and as I drew back, I mean, my pins were kind of all over the place. And I was trying to calm myself, get my breathing right, get settled. Finally got to that point and just expanded my shoulders, hit the trigger, and watched the arrow fly. And as you see on the film, I turn around, I'm like... I don't know. <laughs> Cause what happens is you're shooting a black arrow into a black target. Uh-huh. I do have orange veins, yeah. but at that distance, like Sun I don't, is bright. I yeah. have no idea. And so he runs straight down the mountain. I'm like, well, you when usually when they run down, that means they're hit. Like mm-hmm. it's a good sign. So we, instead of going over to the arrow, we kind of get, we get on the ridge and then just kind of head down. We, we want to get eyes on him to see if he's really it, hurt or exactly. not. Exactly. And we mm-hmm. see him down in the bottom and we're like, is he hurt? Is he not hurt? Like, what is he doing? And he's starting to mess around with these nannies. And we're what was like, going through your head there? Uh, I uh, miss. Yeah. It, yeah. When I saw him acting like that, because like for me, um, with the experience I've had when I've hit animals, they don't necessarily like go right back to the herd and just do what they do. They kind of like peel off by themselves and kind of just like mm-hmm. kind of be by themselves. And, and uh, I've never personally had an experience where the animals group backed up and then just had regular behavior. Yeah. Um, and so whether th- there's truth in that or not, like in my mind, I was like, I think I missed. And so I said, all right, well, we can see him. We know where he's at. I kind of marked, like visually in my mind, this is where I need to go look for blood if I can't find any up here. And so we hiked back up to where we had shot. I had Brian actually stand where I shot from. And so I ranged back so that I knew the exact distance of where I needed to look for my arrow. And we started looking, man, and we could not find it anywhere. Mm-hmm. So then I'm thinking, maybe I hit him. Maybe I hit him. Yeah. Wow, sweet. Um, And so I'm thinking, all right, I need to head back down this ridge and and then Keith comes up and he's like, uh, I think you shot over him. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean I, I shot over him? He's like, well, I'm watching the video and it looks like you shot over him. I'm like, okay, well, if I shot over him, that means the arrow should be over here. And we walked over there. There it was. And there it was, just yeah. clean as can be. I, I don't know how far I shot over him, but I definitely did. And and I'm going to credit that to just that not being able to get – you know, calm, calm and heart under control. You got adrenaline, you got heart, you got all these things going. So I was glad that it was a clean miss on him, but that, that kind of sealed the deal on that day of being able to, uh, chalk that one up as a miss. Um, luckily I was able to get over my misses a little bit faster than you, <laughs> you, you just kind of, you, you seem to kind of like loom on them and, and they were just getting at you where I was like, Oh, that sucks. Like, let, let's go do this. But yeah. then again, like some of the situations you had for me, um, I didn't, I didn't get as many opportunities, but for you, it was like, you just had, you had a, a rough freaking go. Yeah. I just wanted a calm, steady shot where the animal doesn't know I'm there and I can just execute. And I got that. I got that shot. And, um, so, and it's ironic cause it was just a few hours, a, a hour or so after yours. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted a, you know, a steady shot, a, a calm shot. So I don't remember where you guys were at that point, but we, we headed back after that happened. We literally, we couldn't get that bull. The one I was talking about earlier, we couldn't get him off our minds and we knew where he had come out the night before and we got in a better position for him to come out. That's right. That's Mm -hmm. right. Well, we saw, uh, another bull from our lunch vantage point. 
where off to, to off to our right, the opposite direction that you and Sean were headed. That's right. We watched you guys on mm-hmm. that bull for a little while, and then we bailed to yep. go after the other one. And um, we we crept up on that bull, and perfect stock came over the hill, and the bull wasn't there. I have some like, really cool video of that bull up on top of that rock. Yeah. The sun just hitting him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, like, kill me now. Where is this bull? <laughs> like, the bull was there, and now he's not. And so I'm... Uh, I'm I'm looking for some redemption here, I'm, and it, it feels like this bull's going to die. Well, bull, we were like, he must be bedded down right here or something, you know? There's one little ridge where he could have gone behind that ridge, but it was like, I don't know, man. It, to get there, he would have had to be moving pretty fast. And so I'm sitting there waiting for the bull to stand up maybe. We saw some bed up above. And so I was thinking maybe he was bedded there. So was Sam. And finally, after like five minutes, I was like, Sam, how about you go and peek over this little hill and see if he's on that side? That's the only other place he could be. And Sam goes to peek over and that bull sees him and is like, what the hell? You know, <laughs> it jerks its head up and it's freaking out now. And it's running back and forth and it's looking what is at Ed Sam. What's Ed Sheeran doing yeah. on the mountain? Yeah. Ed Sheeran is like <laughs> over Sheeran is over there uh, <laughs> spying on him. So he's, he's like, he's totally focused on on Sam, which is great because I'm, I'm actually down range where any, any, he doesn't even know I'm there. He's so focused on Sam. So he runs. Well, I come to full draw a couple of times. I just can't get a shot because he won't hold still. He's running back and forth. He's stomping. He's whistling. He's running. He's stopping. He's running toward him and then away from him. And you know, just like he is not happy and he bolts to the bottom of this little ridge. And I'm like, okay, all I got to do is move like 10 yards to my left. And I'm going to get like a 30 or 40 yard shot. Probably bull comes out and, uh, just sees us. I mean, just sees us. And he bolts me and Keith. And it's challenging when you got a cameraman right there behind you, or you have also Sam right there. There's three people getting within 40 or 50 yards of a tar. That's a feat because, it's one thing if you're one guy, but if there's three guys and one's actually waving a, a camera around to get the shot, um, and Keith is not about to, um, he's there to get the shot on yeah. camera. That's, that's his job. And, um, but also not blow the stock. And so he's balancing that. But if he can't get the video, then there's no point in getting. You know, taking the shot. It's a cool story. It's not an epic story. Getting the kill shot is what pushes it over to epic. And yeah. So you have to. That's what's hard is a lot of times people are like, man, this this should be a lot easier. And it's yeah. like throw a couple more variables in it, and it makes it tougher. Yeah. Throw a bow in there. Throw a cameraman. Throw an extra body like Sam in there. It yeah. definitely makes it tougher. So he just saw us and ran off. So that bull bolts, and we watched him go down into the Matagari down where you guys were chasing that other bull and he hit that Matagari toward the bottom and just kind of made his way across. And so at that point we were just kind of sitting there going, well, what do we do now? You know, and we look across and right where we were having lunch, just 40 minutes earlier, a bull tar is pushing the nanny up the ridge and he is on her. Like he, she is ready and he is sticking with her and he's going to breed her, you know? So he's following her up the ridge and they're walking right to where we just had breakfast or lunch. I mean, yeah, they're just walking right up to where we had lunch. So we, we beat feet over there, cut over, cut the distance and we get in position and we've just been there crawling around on our bellies and all that. We know where to be. We get in position. looks like that tar and that nanny are going to come right to us. So sure enough, we, we settle in, we're in some dense bushes, some Matagari's there and we're like waiting and the nanny is kind of leading the way up this hill. We can see her. And I'm like, okay. And they, they tend to like to stay on those ridges where they can see, you know, yep. not go down in the cuts where they're blinded, you know. So they're, they're, they're walking up the ridge and we can easily see them. And this bull is, is a good bull. It's good enough for me, man. I'm like, okay, this, this is, it looks like they're going to come within 60 yards. So, I have the range finder out. I'm ranging the hill. I'm ranging objects all around me, trying to figure out distances. If the bull comes here, if he goes there, you know, how far is it going to be? And, um, I got Sam to my right and I got Keith just over my shoulder. And, um, I ask, you know, I'm looking and peeking and it looks like I can get a shot on this 
guitar if I ease forward a little bit. So I, I ease forward a little bit. Now they're, they're coming up the hill though. And this nanny is just freaking switched on. She is like so hyper alert. They're not like grazing and clueless. And there she is like, she is wired Mm -hmm. and which is irritating me because I want her to just, just, just chill, just chill, (laughs) you know, settle down, you know, but she isn't, she is scanning the area. So they're coming up the hill and they're walking right to the spot where we were sitting and we ate our lunch. Maybe we left some bumper bars there. (sighs) Well, I'll tell you what happened is she hits that spot and she's like, ah, no, uh, uh, I don't like this. This, this is this. She just comes alert right away, and she's smelling, and she's smelling us. Oh yeah, from earlier, and she decides, yeah, not cool with this, and she turns around and walks back down the hill. She doesn't run. She's still not sure where the danger is, but she's kind of she saw that stopped, went back down. Well, the bull was kind of just following her up the hill. Well, she goes white right back down and past him, and and she just stands there for a second, and then lays down. Like, okay, um, well, I'm not going any further. You can if you want, you know, but I'm not going to go. Uh, and she just, finally, she's kind of chill. Well, that bull kind of stands around like he's not sure what to do. And I'm like, are they going to go back down the hill again? And this is what we've been experiencing all oh, day, yeah. all the last couple of days. And I'm, so I'm starting to think, okay, they're going to, my, they're not going to walk right past me anymore. They're going to go down the hill back to where they were, and I'm going to lose this opportunity. So I pull out the range finder, and I got the Garmin, and I'm ranging. And anyway, it's 80 yards to this bull. I have an 80-yard pin. It's just perfect. I come to full draw, and I'm just trying to settle in for this shot. And this bull is standing like perfectly broadside. It's a it's a beautiful angle. It's like he's kind of on a uh, skyline almost. Like you got this great shot and I'm at full draw and I'm just slowly pulling through feeling pretty steady, pretty confident in the shot. I'm on my, I'm on my, I'm on my butt though. Uh, actually I, I had shifted to my knees cause I had to get over some bushes. So I, 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 the shot felt pretty good, but as I sat there getting ready to shoot, I was like, I could see his behavior was kind of calm. The, the nanny was pretty chill and 80 yards is a long shot. It just is, you know, and when all variables are set and I'm calm and everything's perfect, yeah, I can make that shot. But I sat there thinking, you know, <clears throat> be more patient, Brian, be more patient. And there's a lot of guys that are, that would, w- are better shots than me in archery that, that could drill that, um, with modern gear and equipment. But for me, I was like, be patient. I think they're going to come closer. I think I'm going to get a better shot. So I let down and a minute later, uh, a little bit later, sure enough, that bull's like gets impatient and he just walks off and leaves the nanny and he starts going up the hill and he hits our spot and he smells it and he's pretty switched on and he starts turning in circles and I'm thinking, okay, I've ranged, range, and I know he's about somewhere around 60 yards. I can tell. So I'm thinking, okay, this is, um, you know, this is, this is going to happen. Sweet. Finally, I have a shot. If I can only get my bow drawn. Cause at 60 yards, we're just, we're just hiding in some brush, but we're exposed. And all he has to do is look over at us and there's Ed Sheeran, there's myself, <laughs> there's the cameraman, you know, and a guy drawing his bow. So I need him to stay away. Well, while the nanny's still a little low on the hill, I'm like, I should draw now. So I don't have four eyeballs to evade just his. So I came to full draw and I tried to keep my bow down, you know, where he couldn't see it, but below some bushes, you know, and now I'm, I'm on my butt though. Cause I was scooting over to get another shot angle when he decided to just trot up the hill. So I'm not on my knees anymore the way I wanted to be. I'm on my butt. And now he's not just, he's kind of up above me to my left a little bit from where I'm sitting down. So now I'm, I'm not in the ideal position, uh, being on my rear sitting and kind of using my abs and, but I'm like, this is, this is it. You make, this is when you make this shot. So I come to full draw, got the bow in position and, um, 
ranged it with the with the Garmin, which was nice because I didn't have to like pull the rangefinder out, range it, you know, and 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 then set a pin or anything like that. I just came to full draw, put the reticle on the on the tar. It it told me it was fifty eight yards. Dropped the pin for me at fifty eight, and uh, and then I tried to settle in for the shot. And uh, he kind of shifted around a little bit, you know, and but he kind of was holding still, and and I was feeling very confident. So I'm at full draw, and I started to try to pull through my hinge release, and I'm I I keep pulling and I keep pulling, and it's not going off, and and I just it's so frustrating because I insisted on hunting with a hinge because I like that challenge, and I and I want to I can I'm very proficient with it in a target situation. But here I am again in a, in a high intensity moment, you know, on a live animal. And I, I just can't get that shot to break and it won't break and it won't break. And, you know, my hand is just super tense, super tight. My right hand, my release hand on that. So the shot breaks and the tar just spins and runs down the hill. And, and uh, I turn to Sam and I'm looking at Sam and he's looking at me and we, we run and we peek over the hill and, and Keith comes with me and we get our eyes on, on this tar and he looks hurt. He looks pretty, he, he, even when the shot broke, I mean, it, he bolted in a way it looked like he was hit. He, he ran down the hill and he kind of looks a little hurt and I'm, I'm expecting him. I'm waiting for him to drop. I'm thinking he's going to drop any second. We're watching and we're watching and he doesn't drop, doesn't drop. And he just keeps walking down the hill and he doesn't drop. And I realize I didn't hit him. He doesn't look hurt. And I get the binos on him and we watch him and he's kind of looking up the hill and we watch him for a while and he's not hurt. He's a miss. So I was at that point I was feeling, I mean, just as archery can make you feel, it just has, you know, it's just challenging. And I had that shot that I'd been wanting, right? That moment. And I just didn't make the shot. I just missed. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm so frustrated, right? Like at this moment. And, uh, I pull a couple arrows out and I just right where that tar was standing, there's a couple of clumps of grass. And I just, in my fury, I just fire off a couple arrows in the clumps of grass and I hit them dead center. Of course, I was standing, not sitting. Yeah, it wasn't that full draw long, there, yeah. right? You know, I wasn't, but I was, and I was relaxed. But I'm like, the grass, bam, wasn't bam, an animal, yeah. And I just slam this grass, and I'm looking at the other two, going, "Bow's on, sight's good, release is good. It's just Brian's not good, you know." <laughs> and uh, it was a moment of of real frustration right there. Just, uh, just. <laughs> It just, and not only did I miss, I missed the whole animal. Like, it's one thing, and I'm glad about that, right? Because you don't want to wound him. No, yeah. But it also is like, how do you miss the entire target when it's it's a big target? And at 60 yards, 58, that's that's a shot I can make all day long. Yeah. You know? So, um, at that point, I'm I'm pretty down and out. And, um, yeah, Casey, I just, it was frustrating. Yeah, it's hard. I mean... And that's really what separates the the boys from the the men is, you know, everybody's going to do that. I've done that. Um, I did that on a bull last year, and the hard thing is, is you have to you have to realize that, you know, you're human. You make mistakes. You can make that shot. You can't let that shot loom in your head. You yeah. have to get over it. It's like a it's like an NFL quarterback that throws an interception. Yep. They if they sit and just confidence think about that, is it's going to kill you. You have to be confident. So like with me, with my miss, I knew immediately I had to just let that go. Yeah. Because when I had another opportunity, I can't be thinking about that over here. It's like when you're golfing, you're like, don't hit it in the water. Don't hit it in the water. <laughs> right, right. Where does it go? <laughs> in the water. Right in the lake. Right, right. So, uh, dude, but I get it. I mean, it is. It's frustrating. And then you're and wanting. I, and you have your scenario, right? You've got the cameraman, right? You've got the tar, right? You've got everything right. And you're like, yeah. now's my time to shine. And that's my mistake, too. I think that's a lot of guys' mistake is in that moment, I, I, 
you've got to stay present. You've got to be thinking about the process. You've got to be saying, dude, this is sweet. I'm so pumped. This is awesome. Look, I'm feeling so good. You got to be like in the process. You can't take yourself out as a third party viewer and be like, this is on film. This is an epic shot. What a, what a good angle this is. I'm about to, you know, then once you do that, you, you, you just, you're not, you're not in the moment. No, you're not. I mean, the way you practice is the way you need to execute it in a hunting situation. You're not thinking that way when you're practicing. And I don't think Casey, for me in this situation that I, that I was out of that. Like I felt in the moment, in the process, I felt great. Everything was going and the shot wouldn't break. I blame it on your hinge. I just blame it on complicating the process where I truly adding another level of difficulty that mean. doesn't adding, need to be there. Adding unnecessary difficulty just in the sense of, I think I've seen you shoot with it and you can shoot. You definitely can shoot with it, but I've also seen you shoot with a trigger and there's just that much more confidence with you when you shoot a trigger. Yeah. And that's probably what you needed in that moment to know. I need it to go. No. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, when it doesn't go and it doesn't go and it doesn't go and form starts to break down and you're like, come on shot, come on, break, go, go. And the shot doesn't go. Then you're starting to shake. You're starting to focus on trying to make the shot go off. You're, you end up ripping it, you yeah. know, instead of like really letting it go through and you start to fatigue and break down. I mean, and, uh, I like that challenge at the same time. It's, I'm, it, it's an eye opener to say, you're not quite ready for that in a live game situation on a tar. Well, and I'll be honest with you. That's why I shoot a, that's why I shoot a, a trigger because it's like, I need to know, you know, that, that if I have to, yeah. in a sense, kind of force that, mm -hmm. like that just scares me to death with a hinge to be like, why aren't you going off? Come on. Why aren't you going off? I'm going to make you go off, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, um, no, it's, it's absolutely a, a struggle and a challenge and that's what I wanted. But, um, I, I, and, and it's part of my whole archery journey. It's fun. I like to shoot a hinge. I just got this thumb release, uh, here, thumb activated release. And, and then I've got a trigger I'm pulling out and I'm using all of them. And I, and we'll do a quick plug for the Garmin, which Garmin doesn't sponsor the show or anything. I'm just using it cause I like it. When I use that zero, it's all dialed for each release I use and different arrows that I use. Oh, I know. And so all I have to do is choose my profile boom, and say, okay, I'm using this release and these arrows. And then instantly everything's set up for those. So it's pretty cool because I can just switch from thing to thing. It's also a temptation. I was going to say, you almost <laughs> need to take that away. <laughs> so, so, just, so that you're not like, Oh, I don't have this set up for my hinge. Yeah. <laughs> Better go to the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is traditionally how a guy would need to do it is to run a, because it's just too much work to set it up differently for each, each, each setup. But no, I, I, I do have respect for you. And I think other people have respect for you that you're willing to throw that element of additional challenge. In because sometimes, you know, I think, I think when you get to the point as a bow hunter where it's not fun anymore, yeah, you need to make it fun again. Not that it's not fun for you anymore, but it's, it is always fun to make it more challenging. That's like the year well, that I went straight trad. Like that's when I really realized yeah. like, holy smokes, this is crazy. Whole fun. Next level. I wasn't ready to commit to that for the rest right. of my life. Like some people, but, uh, switching it up every once in a while is good. But then, but then I would say when you have quote unquote, once in a lifetime scenarios, use the equipment that you are most comfortable with for sure. Um, cause at the end of the day, I don't think anybody really cares what, you know, release you shot it with. They're just stoked for you that you actually got it done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I agree. And when you, the, the thing that I know from experience now using the release, the one thing that it has taught me is that when the stakes are high, you know, and I'm super excited or it's that bull of a lifetime or a buck or whatever that the intensity is on another level. The adrenaline's different. The, the excitement is different. And my ability to really relax through the shot isn't as good period. Yep. It's just not as good. And so being able to, to, to manage like feeling that tenseness, but with an index, I can still make the shot where with the hinge, um, that tenseness, I just, 
it, t- it tells me I, it's, I have something to work on, like yeah. staying relaxed throughout the shot in the, in those intense moments. But that's also why you do it is for those intense moments. I was going to say, if you lose that, it almost doesn't make it fun anymore. Yeah, like. but I want, I want to be able to control it somewhat. <laughs> no, I, I agree a hundred percent. It's, that's it's, that challenge. It's that adrenaline that I look for like that. Yeah. I, I can't get it from anywhere else. Well, like last year when we had that, when we were on that Texas hunt and that white tail stood up, Yeah, you know, index finger release the the trigger, you know, full draw. It's just like, dude, the adrenaline was high. It was pumping, pumping, pumping. You could hear my heart. Right. But it's like, I put it where I wanted it and then I punched it and, and, and <laughs> drilled it. Right. And, and that kind of, um, it didn't matter how nervous I was really in that moment. Cause I'm still picking a spot. I'm still doing all this stuff, but instead of, you know, being a, achieving a surprise release, I, and, and trying to relax through that process, I just slammed it. Yeah. I mean, in, in, with the mo- least, uh, shooter input that I could and let the bow do the work and, and, uh, and, and it's a, it's a great shot. And so it's sort of, it's, it's all a journey, but I have learned from using the hinge, but, um, yeah, that, that was the day that happened. I was like, okay. I wish right now that I had a trigger in my hand <laughs> and I could just co- go out guns a blazing and, and shoot. And Aaron told me a while ago last year, in fact, when I insisted on using a hinge and I shot my mountain goat with it and made like great shots on that. And I, you know, I, I shot a elk in Colorado and, and then, you know, this thing started to fall apart as the season progressed and things happened. And it's like the hinge is a bit advanced for a hunting situation for me, you know, and I know guys that use them and do them really well, but I think I need more years behind it before, yeah. before I'm like that. Um, but Aaron told me, Brian, you've always shot well with the trigger. That's Aaron shot a trigger all last year. He's like, you've always shot well with a index release. So why fix what's not broken? Yeah. But it goes back to, you know, why shoot a trad bow? You know, if you can <laughs> shoot a compound, it's yeah, cause you it's- want the, you want the additional the, challenge, the experience and the, of yeah. it, yeah. And you, it, as long as you mentally are willing to to take less animals, yeah, um, then try it. But if you're like, man, I, I worry what other people think, and I need to kill every hunt I go on, then stick with a freaking trigger. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think some of that <laughs> is, compound. you know, some of that short term too. Like there are guys that when they switch to those things, if it's it's rough in the beginning, but they become more lethal in the long run. And even with guys with trad gear, there are guys that pick it up and become more lethal because they're forced to hone stocking oh, skills. I did not kill anything the year that I hunted with a trad bow. The one opportunity I had was on the hunt that we were on in yeah. North Idaho, and I shot at that elk at like 32 yards, and right. all he had to do was take a step, and he was right past his <laughs> Um Compound, he was dead. Yeah. But I have become so much more lethal th- since I think I've killed like – nine or 10 animals mm-hmm. since. Yeah. Um, and that was just committing one year be- because it was learning how to stalk and how to get in closer, how to be quiet, how to, how to really pick a spot when shooting. I mean, there's so many techniques and, and principles that I learned that I brought over to shooting my compound again. Right. I, I like eating the meat too much <laughs> Yeah, that I was not willing to go another <laughs> year without a full freezer. Um, but I really think that by, by getting uncomfortable, you can definitely learn more. Mm-hmm. But my personal uh, philosophy is: is make sure you're as comfortable as possible when, when it's the that, yeah. that moment of uh, the everything is on the line. Yep. And I used it when I hunted in BC for bears. I used the the hinge and felt super confident. Was crushing the target, you know, in camp out to ninety. But you'd um, also hunted bears before. Like lots of bears. And I, and I don't, you know, this is not me putting words in your head, but you'd never hunted tar before. No. And, and that's, that's the sad reality is just because you're, you're comfortable in one situation doesn't mean you aren't. And just cause you've like, you got ice in your veins here doesn't mean you have it over here. And that's the truth. Like I've killed a few bears with my bow. I've hunted a lot of bears with bow and sneaking up on bears. I have a certain level of confidence due to experience. It's the same with sneaking up on certain animals. Uh, I've been there before. It's like, I, you've done it multiple times. You know, you're going to, it's just, you're executing now in the moment and 
with tar it was like this exotic new adventure <laughs> and i was super excited yeah. i mean i was on another level of 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 in, like wanting to achieve the get this outcome like for myself just wanting it bad where you know with a bear i was i was like i don't care if i kill a bear or don't kill a bear you know it i passed on some opportunities and i was like you know if that's because I'd done it before. So I had a certain plan in place and a goal. And if it didn't work out, it didn't work out. But with Tar, it was like, no, I want this. Mm -hmm. This is the goal. This is going to happen. And that adds a whole nother level of intensity. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think about, I went to Texas and hunted some hogs in Texas. First time I had ever hunted hogs. First time I'd ever hunted out of a blind. Mm -hmm. And I sat for three hours and these hogs finally came in. And my heart literally about pounded out of my chest. I was so excited and it was freaking hogs. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. but it was because it was a new species, new style of hunting, new scenario, new terrain. Like for me, it's all about that experience. Yeah. And that really plays into it. I've hunted mule deer forever. I've hunted elk forever. I still love chasing elk and, mm -hmm. and deer, but at the same time, I'm a lot more calm, collected and confident when I'm behind yeah. And it, the familiarity the, of it, yeah, you know, something just, that I'm familiar with. You throw a new species in there, new terrain, thousands of dollars in plane tickets. Yeah, and I'm losing my crap, man. And, yeah. But I love that though. Yeah. I love that. that oh yeah. Rush and that yeah. feeling. And there is something, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, I think, but there is something about putting your hands on an animal you've never hunted before mm -hmm. that you've seen for the first time close up that you actually take in the wild. There's a, you know, I liken it to someone who's never, um, you know, shot a bear and then walked up on it. It's like a bear is just like, whoa, the curiosity, the, the DNA inside of us, I think, is just programmed to want to be in that moment. Oh, yeah. And whenever it's something new like that, you're just, I want, I want to experience this. And it's, I think as any hunter can relate to that, that there is this innate drive to, you know, I've heard Shane Mahoney talk about this, the conservationist, where there's this desire to, to, um, hold, you know, this desire to, to capture and have, uh, this wild animal. Uh, and it's, um, it, it's part of what makes you human. Yeah. It's like all senses need to be fulfilled. Like you've seen them. Yep. You've smelled them. You've chased them. You've chased them. Like you just need to put your I, hands. I need to touch them. And yeah. I need to eat them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's it's, it's absolutely like, true. There's that, that there's like until you've touched it and eaten it and taken it apart and stuff. It's like, it's hard to describe if you're not a hunter. Yeah. I mean, it's, I talk with a lot of family members that aren't hunters. Like I was up in Yellowstone with, um, some, they're not anti hunters by any means. They just have never hunted. And they were, they were asking a lot of questions, uh, you know, like, why are there no elk or buffalo in the park anymore? You know, just different yeah. things like that. And it was really fun because they were so curious because they're like, what is a bear like? Yeah. And so I showed them some yeah, videos yeah. from bear hunting and they're like, well, why are elk this way? What are they? <laughs> and it's like, man, it's so crazy. Things that I look at and that I've studied mm -hmm. to them, they've never even cared about. Well, when I take a new hunter out, who's never been out before really, and taken an animal that like Shane says, that desire to possess, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds very negative, but even, um, you know, you take someone who, who in any human being that goes out and goes on this venture to hunt, kill their own food and bring it home. There is a desire to possess that animal at some level, just to bring that to closure. And that, that's what I wanted having never shot a tar before and ha being in this experience and just soaking it all in. And it's just, it's so intense, so yeah. intense. And then for it to not pan out like it, like, like, like in my mind, how I expect it to. And I'm coming to full draw and I'm executing that shot. And for it to not, not execute the way, you know, in my mind, I'm seeing this. It was, it was the height of frustration for me. Yeah. It's frustrating. It's heartbreaking. I mean, you think of all the emotion and all the physical exertion that you've put into that moment. And sometimes even like when it comes down to the last day, like you're like so physically or mentally exhausted from all this, like you're just ready for it to happen. Yeah. And then when it doesn't happen, like that's draining. And I'm ready for this whole thing to, I'm like, okay, let's find another tar. All right. 
okay, I just blew it. You know, and it's, it's surprising too, for new hunters out there or people or other hunters who have experienced this, I'm sure you go out and when that happens, you're disgusted with yourself, but then you're like, it calms you way down oh, yeah. for the next shot. You're like, you're, you're like, I've, I've already wet the bed. So now all of a sudden you're just like, you're ready to go. It's like, you can feel that difference and you're like, okay, put another tar in front of me. It's this one's a goner. Yeah. This guy's dead. Yeah. So I'm excited for that moment. And then I get a call. We get a call from you or a text from you and, and Sean right after this tar gets away. And you're like, get over here, get over here. Casey just killed a tar. And there's this, this monster we've been chasing for the last couple of days is here. Come over, come over. So, you know, Sam and Keith and I round up, you know, right after this. And I'm like, okay, let's get redemption here. Um, let's make this happen. So we hot feet, beat feet over to where you guys are. We get over there and, uh, we're high fiving and congratulating <laughs> and stuff because, you you hit this tar without question. You, yeah. you hit it, um, and uh, so so we all are high fiving, and then I watch the video, and it's pretty fascinating because uh, it looks like this tar is it looks like he's 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 uh, died just over the hill. Yeah, you want to talk about a picture perfect scenario? We're sitting on one ridge, so we're sitting kind of mid mountain waiting for these bulls to come out of the Matagari. We're at the same elevation as all the nannies, just like hiding, but knowing that they're going to come up to these nannies and we have nannies on our left, nannies on our right, nannies below us, nannies below, above us. We were surrounded in nannies. So we knew that we were in the right spot. You just needed a bull. Well, then the bull started popping out and that big boy popped out, but he popped out like, three or four ridges over, which was about 240 yards. Mm -hmm. And so now we were excited that we were in piles of nannies, <laughs> but we're not excited because we're going to blow nannies and young bulls all over the place to be able to get over to this guy. And so we're trying to decide what we want to do. Do we need it? Well, we got these guys above us. We can blow them out. That'll be like the least amount. Like, should we go up around, come up on top of him? What should we do? We're trying to put this game plan together. And we've got these nannies 60 yards across the, the way from us. And all of a sudden, this big, big tar. Not as big as the big boy. Yeah, yeah. But, but a, this good, like awesome, burly, grizzly-looking tar rolls up over the ridge and stops right by those nannies at like 60 yards. <laughs> and I look over at Sean because I'm like, I think he's big. Is he big? He's like, oh, he's big. He's big. <laughs> like, <laughs> so... What happened was this bull kind of hung with the nannies for a minute. So I'm getting in position to be able to shoot him. I hand Sean my cell phone so that he can film it since Sean's my professional cameraman, uh, cameraman guide since, since he and key. porter yes. since he carries your gear. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he had it all. He's amazing. Uh, and so this, this bull kind of uh, walks away from the, um, from the nannies a little bit, kind of heads out on his own and he's at like 80 yards yeah. standing perfectly broadside. So I range him. He's at 80. I dial. I pull back on him and just getting ready to execute that shot. And he starts walking again. And as he's walking the way we're, we're close to the top of this ridge. So the, the ridge he's walking, actually, the higher he goes on the ridge, the mm -hmm. closer he's coming to us. So I'm like, sweet. How close is he going to go? So he walks a little ways and then stops and lays down. And so I range him again. He's at 72. So I'm like, Sweet, even <laughs> dial to 72, get ready, pull up, make sure that Sean's got him in video. I'm able to actually stand up, but I can make a lot of movement because I have the sun setting behind me. Mm. And so I stand, draw, sitting down or kneeling down, stand up, and I get it on him, get everything rested. I'm perfectly calm. I've been sitting on this ridge for like almost two hours mm -hmm. waiting for these things to come out. Mm hmm and put it Didn't right. Didn't you already draw to earlier? I had to and let then, down. And then let down. Yeah, when he was at 80, I had to let down because he started walking again. Yeah. And I so knew Just a little closer. more time to calm down and settle. Yeah. And it was just like it was that picture perfect moment that you're talking about, like no win, like everything is just like perfect. It's just mm -hmm. all perfect. And so I, uh, I debated. I was like, I even said, uh, you can hear on the video, I'm like, should I shoot him while he's bedded? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I've never shot a bedded animal before, but I'm picturing in my mind where his vitals are, are being, because he's kind of a little bit quartered away, pointing it uphill away from me. 
And he had this actually, he was a darker tar, but he had this bright, bright yeah. tan patch right where his heart would be. And I could see that. So I'm like, sweet. That's my aiming point. Thank you so much. Right. So I draw back, put my pin on him and I execute the shot, let it rip. And boom, you hear the hit and the thing just starts squealing like a pig. Yeah. And uh, we were just like, man, dead tar, dead tar. I mean, we're high five and we're excited. We see the nannies run out. We don't see him come with them. He piles over this hill down into the Matagari and all the nannies just kind of filter out through the bottom. And we're like, sweet. We are literally going to go over this hillside. And there he is. And there he is. Oh, and, and, and the even better part mm-hmm. is that big bull that we wanted to go after is still sitting. So let's call Brian. Yeah. So that's where we called you guys and you came over. That tar made the strangest sound when you shot it. And I mean, what did you think when you heard that sound? Um, the only thing I could think of like was when I hit the, the pig that I shot in Texas, it made a very similar sound. Like it, it whined and squealed and it was a good shot on that pig. And I just thought, man, this is a solid shot on the confirmation. Tar. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, absolutely confirmation. Yeah. Like no question in my mind he was dead. Everything was executed perfectly. Yeah. Um that's a distance that I'm very comfortable at too. So I you know, no question in my mind. Then I look through my binos where he was laying and I can see my fletchings dug into the dirt. So I'm like, full pass or I got two holes in him. This mm-hmm. is awesome. Mm-hmm. So you guys get over there, we high five, we're excited. That bull, that bigger bull had kind of made his way down to the Matagari. So you guys made your way over. Sean and I made our way um to the arrow and it was filled with like this grisly fat and then a little bit of blood on the fletchings. Yeah. And uh but they have a lot of fur. Well, they got a lot of fur and, and I've got a, a picture from the tar that I had killed in um a few years back. Their skin is literally three quarters of an inch thick, mm-hmm. and then the fat and gristle and everything else starts after that. Yeah. So they are, are a furry, fatty type animal. Um, getting that winter reserve built up for to be able to last during the winter, and so I didn't really think too much of it. Pulled my arrow and started looking for blood, and couldn't find any blood. So I'm like, all right, well maybe he bled later. Maybe it sopped up in in the uh, in the coat. Mm-hmm. So he went up over the ridge where he would have gone, went up to the top of the ridge, looked down, expected to see a tar laying there, and there's nothing. And so we went back, looked for blood, checked all over, no blood. So Sean went down in the bottom and started checking the Matagari. And as we explained before, the Matagari is just thick as can be. Yeah. And it's spiky. It sucks. Um, you can't see through it. Like Unless you are on top of something, you would never see it. So we, you guys had gone after those tar. Nothing was going to happen there. So you guys kind of circled back and we said, all right, it's going to be dark here in a few minutes. None of us really have what we need to be able to find this thing. So let's extend our hunt one more day. Cause that was technically the last, yeah, the last night that we were going to be hunting. Yeah. We were supposed to go back. Let's extend that it. That was the end of day three. The end of day three. And day yeah. one was eaten up by fog primarily. Yep. So yeah, it's the end of day three and, and, uh, so we had one more day. Yeah. One more morning. One more morning, basically, to be able to find my tar, and then you had an opportunity to be able to get one down. Yeah. Um, so so uh, I, was, I was glad to have that next day. And, yeah. But as we were leaving that night, um, how were you feeling? I mean... Uh, I felt good. Still going back to the noise it made, a little bit of blood on the arrow, like my previous experience, like when I had shot the tar before I had shot it with a rifle and it didn't bleed very much. Yeah. Um, and so I wasn't too worried about it. Um, so I was, I was actually able to sleep really well. I mean, we watched that video. I don't know how yeah. many times that night trying to figure it out, but it was just, I mean, he looks, shot on a he, cell phone. Yeah. He looked hurt though. He looked like you nailed him. But really at the end of the day, I felt like I did everything that I could to, to execute the, the perfect shot that it would just boil down to. All right, now it's time just for your tracking find skills. Yep. Yeah, he's going to be in that Matagari somewhere. Um, so the next day we go back, uh, and we have, uh, you know, the morning to look, and then we got to get gone for that after get out of there that afternoon and get home because we have a long drive back to the lodge, and then we fly home mm-hmm. the next day. And so, um. Yeah, we we head out that morning, and you and Sean take off to look for your tar, and Sam and Keith and I go up the canyon. 
uh, to see if we can get one. And I got the bow, but now it's like rifle time. <laughs> like, like if there's something there within bow range, I'm certainly going to stock it and shoot it. But at this point, it's, it's a decision whether you go home without a tar at all. You know, as, as we hunted that morning for a couple of hours, there's just no tar on no bulls anywhere where we hunted that morning. Then we saw a couple across the canyon and up on the hill, but there was nothing right there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was kind of like that sweet spot of where we had been hunting them and seen him, them had kind of spoiled and they had all gone to different areas now. Like even where we were, there wasn't all, all the tar that were typically down in the Matagari were gone. They were gone. Yeah. I mean, we had pushed them around a bit, you know, hunting them there, but so, um, it wasn't a hard decision for me to break out the rifle. It really wasn't. Uh, I, I loved hunting tar with a bow and arrow for three days, essentially. And, but I also was real excited about bringing out the rifle and actually getting a tar on the ground and actually possessing, touching, holding, skinning, eating, you know, the whole deal. Right. I wanted that experience. I always do, you know, and I've never understood the old moniker, like never pass up on an animal, uh, on the first day that you would, that you wouldn't pass up on the last day. I've never understood that because I actually like passing up opportunities because I don't want my hunt to end. My hunt's not about the animal. Yeah. I want it to go further, longer. I want the experience, the chase, whatever it might be. And in this case, I was able to have three full days of tough, you know, close encounters, even got to shoot my bow, learn some things about myself, back to the drawing board kind of stuff. And then here I am at the end and it's like, okay, now I'm going to take out the rifle and there's significantly less stress when you bring out a rifle than a bow. It's like, um, now it's, 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 it becomes fun. It's not a, it's kind of not a question of whether you shoot a tar or not. It's, you know, which one do you shoot? Mm -hmm. And that has its own level of, of, of kind of excitement that comes from it. So we hunted that morning and I kept being like, Sam, I think there might be one here and I could get it with my bow and we could do this here and here. And Sam's kind of like looking at me, like (laughs) the bow days are over, my friend, Uh, we got to go home. Yeah. (laughs) We got to go home. (laughs) So, um, we're sitting there and, it was really fun though because we got to gla- we just got to our ridge, our point. We waited for fog to disappear, and we were just glassing and glassing, and and it was exciting now because Sam's getting excited because now it's not again, it's not like you know just trying to hunt the opportunity. Now you're actually picking exactly what you want off the mountain, you know. And so Sam's like looking for a big, gorgeous tar that is is, uh, you know, a great representation of what a big mature bull looks like. And so I'm able to just glass and glassing is fun. Yeah. And we're spotting all these tar and, and then he sees this tar that's pretty far away and not far. I mean, a few miles in, we could hike there and shoot it. And, and he's like, that's our, that right now is a beautiful tar. That's when we could shoot. And it was kind of up in the snow and it was pretty deep. And that's kind of what I wanted to go do. But then right across from us about 700 yards a, a nice bull is following a bunch of nannies and it starts coming down the mountain into the canyon off the cliff and i'm just watching and watching we watch it and it just keeps getting closer and closer and closer and we're snacking and eating our new zealand lunch and all this and it just keeps getting closer and closer and sam's looking at me he's like there's your bull <laughs> there's your bull he's offering himself yeah to you. and i'm like <laughs> All right, let's make it happen cuz I'm ready. I'm ready to to uh take a bull and and I know the clock is ticking. We got I got to take this bull and we got to get out of here. And there's uh and I'm looking across and Sam's like, "It's 440 yards." I'm like, "Sam, that's a long way." You know, I that's that's further than I've ever shot a live animal with a rifle before. I've practiced out to distances that far. And farther, lots farther. I've shot a few rounds with you a few times. Um, and I'm, I'm not bad with a rifle, you know, if I have time to set up and so forth. And, um, so I was, I was pretty excited to, so Sam hands me his rifle and he's like, don't worry. I got this 
he's got this Leupold five something on there and he, and he got last year and he's like, I'll the dial X5. it. Yeah. I'll buy it, dial it to what you want and you're going to be, you're going to be ready to roll and, uh, or dial it to the yardage and we'll be ready to roll. So he hands me the rifle, he dials it, hands it to me. And, um, I, I got the pack all set up and got the rifle set up. And basically the rifle was just set up. So I didn't really have to touch it. You know, the crosshairs are right on the tar, right where it needs to be. You know, my adrenaline starts pumping, you know, the heart starts pounding and, and uh, a little more excitement than I expect, you know, with a rifle in hand, but it's also far away. Um, and ironically, it's almost where we did that first stalk on the first day in that Canyon where that, where those tar climbed that vertical wall. It's just right above that vertical yeah, wall, that. just above it. And so we're trying to make sure that if we shoot, it doesn't fall hundreds of feet, thousands of feet to the ground. So he's kind of waiting for it to get to a spot. And sure enough, it looks like it's in a good spot. Well, all this time I get to watch this tar through a spotter and see the main puff up, watch it strut around, watch it follow these nannies, kind of show off. And then I see its mane come down and then stand back up. And he's just kind of showing off. And it just, I just enjoy watching, watching the whole spectacle, the whole thing. They're just amazing animals. And so at that point, I'm, I'm, I'm like, let's make this happen. Let's, let's hit this. Let's shoot this tar, make a great shot on him. And I, I just, uh, it's time, you know, so I settle in and, um, just, put the crosshairs where they needed to be and started to, you know, squeeze the trigger and, uh, the shot goes and that tar just buckles. Like I can see through the scope, it just smack. And, um, you know, Sam had told me that tar are really, really tough. And if you shoot them through the rib cage and you blow out their heart and lungs, it doesn't matter they'll still run, 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 run and climb and, and bolt. And they'll, they can go quite a while. Um, even though you've taken out the, the boiler room, their engine. And uh, he's like, shoot them through the shoulders, mm-hmm. you know, take them in a two wheel drive. Yeah. You'll hit them. You'll hit a, hit the heart and all that kind of stuff or, or the front of those vitals, but you'll also make it so they can't run anywhere. So, uh, he's quartering away just a little bit. I, I aimed at the uh, exit hole I wanted to have on it. And, um, and smack those shoulders. And he just, you can see the vapor trail from that bullet. It just goes right through. And that thing just, and just, just having the rifle in hand and experiencing that is pretty cool because yeah. rifles are amazing <laughs> what they can do. And, and, uh, that tar didn't stand a chance. I mean, it just didn't have a, a prayer, you know, and, and it was a very quick death. And you can see the argument for why hunting with a rifle for many is, is, uh, a very ethical way to, to take a life because it just, it's almost instantaneous, you know, it hit that tar. It didn't know what happened. It fell on the ground in shock. And then it's just sitting there. It's dead. It's, it's over. Yeah. So Sam was like, his hands were shaking and he was like super nervous. And he was like, Oh, he, I think he was more nervous than I was. He, probably was. <laughs> he really wanted to see me, uh, get a tar, you know? And so on our half day morning of, of, of that last, I was able to take that tar and, and I'm looking across the canyon and there's no other word to describe it, but epic, majestic. I mean, it just, it's beautiful. The, the, the view, the country. And so we pack up and start making our way over there. And literally it's, it's like straight down and straight up. And in some places you have to go through just neck deep Madagari. There's otherwise you got to go, you know, long, long way around. And so, um, you know, we hike down these sheer cliffs and these shale rock slides, get to the bottom, which was refreshing. Got some water, drank, hit the next, uh, the next slope after we crossed the river and climbed and I'm all into that, man. <laughs> like just climbing, hiking, you know, get just, there's something about climbing a mountain that is just all I like. I always, I want to like, I hiked with Jordan this last weekend. 
I'm, I'm like, I want to go to the top. Yeah. And he's texting me and he's like, you're going too far. Are you trying to get extra credit? Like, where are you going? <laughs> and I'm like, I want to go to the top. Like, how close are we to the top? He's like, the top is a long way still, my friend. I'm like, well, that, that looks like the top there. It's got like 20 false summits. Yeah, that's but, a false summit. <laughs> but I was like, you just, I'm compelled to go to the top, you know? And finally, and we were hunting in just more, more, uh, the, the lower, little lower elevation stuff most of the time. And so it was great to just get out there and with the rifle shoot from those high elevation peaks and then to, uh, to do the, that hiking that I love to do. And we, we got up there and I come walking down on the tar and <laughs> I've never seen one like on the hoof like that before that close to touch. And just to be able to walk up and put your hands on something like that for the first time. I mean, I can remember the first deer, the first elk, the first bear. It never ceases to amaze me that first of any species that I've pursued and taken, it just, it's a special moment. And here I am, like, you know, you're putting your hands on it and you're, t- and I'm, I'm, I'm blown away. And, um, and it, the, I can't believe how, Big the mane is, yeah. and then and then Sam's like, move him, you know. I pick him up, and I'm like, Man, it's like a pony. It's, heavy. it's like a little pony. <laughs> uh, the the legs, they're just the bones, the density of the animal. Even though it's a small in stature, it's got density. It's yeah, thick. they're. I mean, their joints are probably the size of cow elk. Yeah, it's yeah. just really, really. They're not as long. The the yeah. femur and everything else isn't as long, but just the joints thick... are just these giant knots. Yeah, and so I'm sitting there and. You get to, to touch it for the first time and, and, um, the smell. Well, I was going to say what I love the most <laughs> was their coats are really waxy. Yes. And then yeah. that musty smell. Because you guys, um, down, down here in the office, at, at, in the studio here, you guys, uh, at Mountain Ops, you have, um, in the entryway, you guys have a Arapawa. Yeah. The Arapawa, which is the Spanish Merino. It's a ram. Yeah. Jordan it's a, like a wild there. ram sheep of some kind feral feral sheep feral in, sheep, in new zealand yeah. and um he bow hunted that yeah jordan shot that with yeah. a bow and, and then and they're all over and and yeah. and that, that was cool well they have like the dreads yeah like, they call them bob marley rams because they yeah. got the dreads and they got this crap and, everywhere <laughs> and they're i saw a few of them mounted and without fail every single one of them has dirt and sticks and brush I mean, you and can't seeds. get it out there's no it's just sense. it's it's part of the mount like mm-hmm. it's part of the hide well, tar, they're clean. Oh, like so clean. The, the, the fur doesn't have any knots in it. It's not for being such a long hide. And, you know, bears are similar. I mean, sometimes they can get some brush or some seeds or whatever kind of top. top. But even bears, they're, they're, their hides stay pretty clean, but not like a tar. The tar is like waxy and straight. And they, condition they look really like they're, well. yeah, they look like they're brushed. No, they really do. It's yeah. crazy. Like you would, you would look at the tar that are in our office at Jordan and I shot. You think, Oh, did you guys like really like posture? You texted him. We did a good job brushing those. It's like, that's how I looked when we shot him. Yeah. Like they are gorgeous. Well, and tar have a, um, like all goats, they have a hollow hair follicle Mm -hmm. and it's thicker and longer and goats in general tend to, you know, have that, but tar on another level, it's like waxy and straight. Um, they look like they're, they look pristine. Yeah. So being able to touch that and just feel that coat, uh, and the smell, the smell is actually kind of a sweet musk. It wasn't mm-hmm. offensive. Not at all. Actually, I, so I, um, I, my backpack doesn't smell like it anymore cause I've had a couple other animals in there, but for about a year and a half, I, I, I had used this backpack mm-hmm. on my tar hunt and I could open it up and still smell it. Yeah. And I loved it. Well, it was funny. Like, I mean, just about two, two or three minutes before I shot that tar, he had mounted a, uh, a, a nanny and bred her. And, uh, we just barely missed that on film, which Sam was thoroughly disappointed. <laughs> it's the first time That's ever. That's why he was so Yeah. It's the first time ever he had seen a <laughs> nanny bred by a, by a bull tar. I'm like, really? That, I saw it. Like my first time hunting them. Like my fourth time. Yeah. And so, uh, he was like, dang it. He was trying to get the, the lens back. He just turned the camera off when, when he, when he did it. Well, then I settle in and I shoot the tar and we go over there and down in the nether region where the manliness is, 
It definitely had a strong odor, and that little spot was nasty looking. Yeah. Like, they had, you know, he's a busy man. And, yeah. uh, and that spot I didn't want to touch. That had some, some strong, it's like the scent glands and all the stuff that happens. And so cutting around that or whatever as you're taking it apart was fine, but that little spot was pretty gnarly. Yeah, they have these feral goats out there that are different from the Arapawas. And I don't even know what they're called. They're like those same goats that you'll see over in Hawaii that have the really curly, like yeah. straight out. Yeah. Those things Marco stink. Marco Polo looking. Yeah, those yeah. things stink so bad. Yeah, I heard about that. And they literally, they're white, uh-huh. but they are like yellow brownish down by <laughs> down their by their parts. Man. Because <laughs> That's I don't what, know what they This do. tar was like black as night oh right there, and it was gosh. little curly fur that was all... Yes, it's like, all curly. Too, yeah, it was yes. all like nasty. Everything's straight, but it's down all there, sticky they the and gooey right there. I was like... <laughs> Oh, and Sian was like, had to cut through it as he's, you know, preparing, pulling the hide off. And it's like, I'm like, Sam, do not touch that. He's like, there's not much you can do yeah. to get around. Touches it. And it's like, it's on your hands cool. for like <laughs> something everyone is experiencing. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so, um, but we break it down, got that tar all loaded up and, and, uh, hiked off the mountain that afternoon. And, uh, I was grateful for that half day, you know, for that experience to be able to, pull out the rifle and, and to shoot it. And, and, and it, I, every time I go on a rifle hunt, it's, I'm always, um, cause I'm so biased toward bow hunting in terms of what I think I want to do. But every time I bring out the rifle, I am surprised by how much I enjoy it. And I'm just, I'm just committed to do more of that mm-hmm. than I, than I have in the past. Uh, you get more seasons, more opportunities in certain places, and it's just a, it's a different kind of adventure, but it's still an adventure. Yeah. I mean, for me, I used to, I used to just only rifle hunt. I, I started out archery hunting then went only, or rifle hunting, then only archery, then rifle, archery, then back to rifle, then archery. And now I just love both. Yeah. I don't, I don't like, I find opportunity for both and I love both because they, they each present their own challenges and circumstances. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think anybody should feel bad for hunting. Well, last year, one. last year I went out on a uh, rifle, late season rifle hunt with Ben and Anthony, my two friends, close friends, Ben and Anthony and their children. So, uh, us, us adults, us men didn't have rifles, but the young men, uh, Ben's son and Anthony's sons uh, all had tags, so us dads were there just to get them, get them uh, uh, a, 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 an elk or a mule deer. And uh, we went back deep. It was 17 miles on foot that day. It was a rugged hike. It was gnarly. It was snow. It was cold. There were elk everywhere. It was a, it was a, it was an awesome hunt. And uh, rifle in hand, I loved it. Yeah. Loved every minute of it. And Anthony's boys tagged out. Ben's son only had one day. Um, he had a nice 300 yard shot at a bull. Good setup, just not enough time behind the rifle. He missed and, um, but it was, it was, it was, it made him really want to go home and practice more with the gun. But man, uh, I, yeah, it doesn't cease to, to amaze me how fun it all is just getting outdoors in general. I was gonna say if it if it's an excuse to go outdoors, go do it. Yeah, and now I had some people write in. They're like, "Hey, how much does it cost to go on a tar hunt? And what's it cost to go on a on a stag hunt? And what's it cost to go to New Zealand?" And you know, in my in my mind, I think uh, you can go. So I had a lot of New Zealanders respond on on um, Instagram and so forth. And I think um, I think it was like five thousand or something to go with. Cur- uh, Venator Cardrona Safaris, which how which w- w- was where we went. Um, plus the airfare was I think. Mm, so airfare was like fifteen hundred bucks each, but then uh, like Air New Zealand, who we flew out on, you got to pay. They only allow one bag, so where you're bringing bows, yeah, you got to um, pay for yeah luggage. There was a couple extra. Luggage. So you're really would, two. Mm, well, when, if you divided that out, you're fifteen to eighteen hundred. Mm-hmm. Because Keith had a lot of camera bags. Too. Yeah, yeah. So if you're for four bags, it was six hundred and fifty bucks. Six or seven thousand total plus. You you know I don't know somewhere you could do it. Um, but yeah, then, I've, I've always told people 
mm-hmm. seven grand and you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. That gets you, that that's gets you everything. That's with someone that's with a guide and with a guide. Yeah. yeah. That's somebody that's going to walk you through the process, help, you know, expedite the education yeah. on it, you know. In some sense, though, to me, in some ways, this is how I justify it in my mind. You got to deduct the cost of going to New Zealand as you would like a trip to Hawaii or Cancun or something like that's just part of going to someplace exotic. Well, that's the thing is like you get your money's worth just being there. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you get a hunt. Like that's how amazing New Zealand is. And between the people, yeah, the actual views, like everything, the experience, the meat pies. Yeah. I I I think the public land in New Zealand is a big, big uh, allure because, you know, you can go some places that are truly epic public land and so some some folks got on there and said well if i want to do a, a stag hunt you know what if i want to do that and if a few new zealanders got on there and said well you could stag hunt up north in and and get into some bigger older stags but for the most part they're they're killed by market hunters who are shooting them from helicopters for meat uh yeah. they're an invasive species they just fly out and so n- none of them reach a mature age mm-hmm. out there because they just get shot every year um by the by the market hunters so public land stag is is not much of a um, like if you kill a three hundred inch stag that's pretty dang good and on public oh land. that yeah that's pretty dang good yep exactly so they one thing they said though was it's hard to beat a public land tar hunt like yeah. that is doable and uh, a bunch of guys said you know you could do that for for three four thousand yep. New Zealand New Zealanders um, total price and uh, to me to add to that you can shoot. The other critters like chamois or arapawa, you know, other things that are out there as well. They've got hogs out there. They've got all kinds of stuff. Rabbits, lots of rabbits. Rabbits. (laughs) And then on top of that, the fishing, which to me, it's worth going just to fly fish for brown trout the size of, you know, sharks. Like, Like for you and I, we were out there. We literally flew out there, had three days to hunt, four days to hunt, and then flew back. So we needed to do that type of experience. We needed... Uh, a little bit of help, if you will. If you were going to go do it yourself, plan 10 days. Or and two, go weeks, do it. two weeks, 14. Two weeks, yeah. 10 to 14 days and go do it. Don't rush it like we did. I did not Prince of Wales Island like that. I just filled my backpack up with stuff. I flew in with my brother-in-law. We got there. Our only luggage was our backpacks for backpacking. Um, we, we, you know, a week and a half worth of food. We rented a car for 500 bucks for a week, which we split the cost of. And then we drove out to a spot on a map that we had picked randomly that was just public. We didn't know if there were deer there or not. And then we just hiked in and hunted it, shot deer and came home. And uh, the whole trip was really inexpensive. Yeah. Uh, And New Zealand can be done similarly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You don't have to, you don't have to spend the money, but we enjoy the company. Yeah. I was going to say. It's fun to hunt with a kiwi. It is. You know? <laughs> it's a lot and, of fun. <laughs> and, uh, and then on top of that, the, uh, the people at Cardrona are just, they're so awesome. Yeah. And the, the, the food and it, it felt like, a you know, a, a, a t- there's such a luxury experience for me. Um, not unlike if I went to, Cancun or an all inclusive mm-hmm. vacation with my wife, you know, except I'm flinging arrows at tar on the mountain. You know, it was just a, it's a good adventure and a chance to, to take in another country and another culture that, um, that is pretty cool. Yeah. And I would say like the type of experience that you're paying for, whether you're at the $7,000 or if you can budget it and get it down to $3,000 and you want to, you know, skimp and save and do whatever. It's, it's something that everybody needs to do. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about all these guys that aspire to go hunt stone sheep or go hunt, you know, mountain goats or whatever in BC and, and not to take anything away from those, but I've talked to a lot of people that have done both mm-hmm. and they love tar yeah. in New Zealand, love tar in New Zealand. And it's more affordable yeah. and more obtainable. They are super cool animals, the way they strut and show off and, and, uh, fight. Um, they're far more aggressive than any sheep I've seen, any goats I've seen in North America, um, wild, you know, they're, they're like bold. Um, a few of them were pissed off when you got close to them and they were like, like they would try to 
intimidate you and, mm. and like stomp their hoofs and jump to the left and jump to the right and shake their head like bring it you yeah. know that is and then their mane is shaking totally different temperament and i i don't i've never really seen that when a when a stone sheep sees a hunter they don't like oh yeah bring it they <laughs> don't go, it's not their <laughs> it's just a different animal man different animal so very cool um so I think that wraps it up. I mean, anything else you want to throw in there? I mean, the only the other thing is, is New Zealand's worth going to just for the meat pies. Although I've been told by the New, the Australians that they make better meat pie. Well, somebody from Australia needs to invite us to come and, <laughs> and prove that. <laughs> and maybe we'll kill an Asian water buffalo. <laughs> yeah, Australia, I was saying uh, on this podcast I did with Dallas, I was like, okay, Dallas, Joe Rogan has some fear about going to some, it, I, we'll, we'll just say some survival instinct, not fear, yeah. uh, 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 which prevents him from perhaps experiencing Australia. But you could go to New Zealand and experience sort of probably similar things without any of the animals that will kill you. Yep. No predators. Yeah. That's crazy. And And yet you get that otherworldly experience. It's pretty cool. I think what did Sean or Sam said, New Zealand is the... I think the second or the number, the safest place for Americans to travel in the world. It is the number one safest place. For number one. American tourism. Yep. I, <laughs> so I, come on, like, Joe. They like our money. Right. <laughs> come on, Joe. Like there's nothing to be afraid of there. So <laughs> no, uh, the, uh, I would say the only other thing is people are probably wondering what happened with my tar. And the sad story is that, um, Sean and I looked, it was from about eight o'clock in the morning till, four in the afternoon yeah when we, you guys finally got back and we searched every physical inch that we could actually get into of the matagari and we didn't even find one drop of blood so it it's an absolute mystery what happened and we actually found another tar that had died probably a few months ago yeah it was a nice bowl probably about the same size as the one i had shot yep. but that was the one thing i did come across was a lot of dead tar and other animals too mm -hmm. they just there's there's not a, any scavengers, no no wolves, no coyotes, no bobcats, no cougars, mountain lions. There's really not much to to like. If one of those animals died in Alberta, it'd be gone before the next morning. Yeah, it'd be eaten. Something. No, I mean it was like crazy because this this tar had probably died, you know, within a couple of months, and it just looked like. I mean, it was yeah. decomposing, but it, it just looked, looked like untouched. It did when it. Where yeah. it died. Yeah, I saw an Albert, uh, an albino uh, bull tar, big, a nice big albino oh, you guys bull found tar. Found that it died. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yep. I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Uh, we saw a few albino tar, but yeah. never saw. They were all uh, never. Nannies. Yep, never saw a bull, but uh, this one, nice bull, but yeah, had died. I don't know, maybe a month or so earlier. But that's crazy. You come across these fully intact, untouched bones aren't scattered. It's just slowly decomposing kind of thing. And it's, it's a strange Yeah. that I'm not saying New Zealand has the ecosystem thing. Like it's just been thrown into the 20th century, <laughs> like it or not. 80 million years of isolation have now been disrupted. Exactly. There's no going back. The no. cat is out of the bag. Um, so, but it sure does make it a, a fascinating place to visit you know, um, hopefully a lot of those native species as they try to manage these populations, which is partly why we hunt tar, partly why you go to New Zealand at all is you go there. There's a lot of income that New Zealand makes from, mm -hmm. from tourism, from hunters coming in. They, they shoot these tar, they take them out of the population, which if they don't do it that way, then they're going to shoot them by helicopter. And that costs them money because it's done through the government. Through the taxes mm -hmm. and so on. Tar meat isn't exactly sought after. So they use, a lot of times they'll use, uh, you know, they'll they'll market hunt stags, but they're not market. They're just shooting the tar and leaving them yeah. there. And yeah, I think the stags they were saying, the the venison from the red deer is like six bucks a pound. Mm -hmm. So they sell it for Right. Them. Yep. There's enough money in it that it's worth it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they, they manage tar through multiple means, but one is through hunting, which is a, is a, is a great way to do it because they keep the populations at a certain level that then, then the native species can thrive, still thrive and they keep 
the population's isolated, so they're trying to keep them out of other areas of New Zealand where it hasn't been disturbed by an invasive species. And uh, and then the, it brings in all that income, and it just makes a lot of sense, yep. you know. Um, and tar being, you know, on the verge of, uh, you know, being a threatened species in other parts of the country, like Pakistan and Tibet and so forth. Here, now you have this huge booming population of an, of an animal that was threatened at one point in time. Now it's, now it's got a safe haven. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. All right, Casey. Thanks for joining me, brother. No, thank great, you. Great, great. Uh, thanks for reliving that with yeah, me. Yeah, that was fun. I can't wait to go back. <laughs> and uh, for those of you listening, um, thanks for tuning in to Gritty Podcast and leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe to our YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff. Tell your friends about the show. I appreciate all of that very much. Stay gritty. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky, and on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman.